Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday morning at Chem 1211 with your host, Dr. White. And it's a sad day because it's our last full lecture. Uh, the one regret I have this semester, while it sure went fast, is that because of Zoom, uh, I didn't get a chance to meet all of you, get to know you. And we do face to face in the lab. I have a couple hours to walk around and get to know everybody. And fortunately, that doesn't happen with Zoom. You got to know me, but I didn't get to know you. But I did get to know a couple, number of you, which is a good thing. All right, all semester I've been re, re, tr trying to remind myself, hmm, do this, and I forget. So let me, finally I remembered to do something. And a friend of mine's, my best friend, actually, I've known him since high school. Wow, that goes back to 60, never mind. Anyways, for many decades, we've been close friends like this. He's really the brother I never had. I have two sisters, and we've been that close all that time. And his wife I'm close to, and she teaches in Fort Wayne Middle School. And a while ago, she sent me the following, which I'm going to share to you now. Everybody see that? And yes. I see you all see it. <laughs> and no, I don't look at my what microwave, but it's always not so much this class, but another class I teach. Nobody shows up early. No one. They usually wait until about 30 seconds before class. So I'm thinking, where are all my students? <laughs> and that cartoon. I sent it around the faculty here at the other school and everybody loved it. All right, last week, last lecture, let me remind you, we're not really having lab Thursday and Friday, but your labs are due. Make sure you get them in or you'll lose 10 points if you do it correctly. You don't want that to happen. But for this Thursday and Friday, for about 40, 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes, I will go through some practice problems, both on Thursday and Friday. Those of you who have lab on Friday, you can use your Friday login information to log in on Thursday. It was the same for both. I just kept it a secret. And those of you on Thursday, you can use your Thursday login information to log in on Friday. And by the way, it's the same login for our lectures. Made my life and your life easier. So it's totally optional, but I'd highly recommend it. And with that, I'm going to start back with the review for the final. I'm glad you enjoyed everybody that cartoon. Speaking of the final, this coming Monday, there will be no class. Uh, it's finals week. I'm not the only one who's having no class. No instructor should have any class. You should just have your final. So therefore, at about 10 o'clock next Monday, I will send out the email with the password for the final exam. Look at the announcement, which I also sent you, the fact that you have not until the next day to get it in, but until 1 p.m. Since we're not having lecture and you're supposed to be here, this is not an internet class, it's a VCM, virtual classroom meeting. The final is on Monday, 10 to uh, 12 or 11.50. Since you have to do extra stuff, I give you extra time the deadline to get it uploaded is Monday, 1 p.m., unless you have uh, talked to me about special accommodations, which I have done for certain students, otherwise known as blue card students, and don't identify yourself if you are a blue card student. 
All right. And I reserve the right to take off 50, yes, 50 points if you don't follow my instructions. Finals week, I'm very busy and I don't have time to play around. And any questions on that? All right. That's the manager, Dr. White, talking. All right, everybody see test number two review on your screen? All right, thank you. I see a question first. Liliana's question, uh, the exam is from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., handed in by 1 p.m., and yes, the same day. You know something? We got time. Let me do something. Log into Blackboard. Uh, Gabby, you can find the test reviews in the lecture section of Blackboard. And I'll show you that in a second. But first, let me answer Bojana's question. Notice here, let me ask, thumbs up people, can you say hi everyone? Now can you see hi everyone? Did you paint a little picture on your thumb for Dr. White? <laughs> no. But anyways, uh, as you can see, and this was mailed to you, on Monday at 10 a.m., I'll email you the password. You have until Monday, the same day, till 1 p.m. to take the final exam. And in the email I'll send you with the password, I'll mention it again. You have until that Monday, 1 p.m. If you don't follow instructions, I reserve the right to subtract up to 50 points. And here's the point breakdown. Now, that's one question. Everybody see me as I'm clicking on course information? Lectures. Click on. And scroll all the way to the bottom. And you'll see right here, test number one review, which I didn't have as a word, just a PDF. And test number two review, test number uh, three review, I also have important information. Test number four review. And I also have important information, final exam, and I highly recommend you all look at that because those are things I will give you for the final exam. Anybody have any other questions about the final exam? And as I said in the first day, and I've done all semester, there's no such thing as a dumb question in my universe, in my class, anywhere around me, there's no such thing ever. And with that, tea time. And you know, that's yes, it's my blueberry tea. All right, let's get going on test number two review. Everybody see test number two review on the screen now? Thank you. All right. We talk about where are the electrons in the nucleus, the protons and neutrons are there, but the electrons are in the electron cloud, which are located in shells around the nucleus. The shells have names, shell one, two, three, and four. And they have here the number of subshells. One has one, two has two, three has three, four has four. And what I don't have on here, but you should remember
and shell one is the lowest energy, shell four is the highest energy. And then subshells have names, S, P, D, and F. And as I have right here, showing the energy, S is the lowest energy subshell. And F is the highest. And this will be given to you shell and subshell, but not what I just wrote. And shell S, subshell S has two electrons, P maximum six, D maximum 10, F maximum 14. Now, one of the things I asked you to do was know how to write or draw the electron configuration. And that's a statement of how many electrons an atom has in its subshell. And again, you use numbers, letters, and superscript numbers. And if you look at test number two, I gave you questions like this. How do you do that? Well, in order to draw the electron configuration for nitrogen, which has a chemical symbol N, which you don't need, but I'm putting it down, you need to look at the periodic table. Everybody see the periodic table? Thank you. And here's nitrogen, and you need to know how many electrons does nitrogen have? And for the electron configuration, the atomic number tells you how many electrons and protons, and the answer is seven. So I have seven electrons to fill. The first shell is one, and has one subshell. Remember, a subshell is a number and a letter, so it's 1s, and the maximum I can put in there is 2. Shell 1 only has one subshell. I filled it, so now I have to go to the next shell, and the first subshell is also s, and remember, a subshell is number 2 and s. That looks like a z. Hold on. I feel better. <laughs> it looks like ugly too, but it works. And the first subshell in two is 2s. And the maximum number of electrons are two. So I have four, but I need seven. So I, how many subshells does two have? And if you look at the table, which you'll be given, I don't have to because I know this by heart, is two subshells. And the second one is P. You always start from the lowest S, then go to P. D and F. How many electrons can I put maximum in any p orbital? And the answer is six, but seven minus four, and correct me if I'm wrong, is three. So I'm going to put three in there. Two plus two is four plus three is seven, and that's how you do it. And I highly recommend you know how to do that. Ooh. Don't forget my special gift to you. Only, you only have to know how to go up to magnesium for the electron configuration. Remember, shh, don't tell anybody. Next, I talked about valence electrons. Everybody see valence electrons? If you can, tell me how I can see them too. <laughs> I can't, I've never seen them. Ah, bad humor in the last day. Got you. All right. Now, 
Valence electrons are the outermost electrons of an element, which you should know. Look at test two, I asked that. And how can you find how many valence electrons an element has? You look at the top of the periodic table. So let's do that right now. And hopefully everybody can see the periodic table. Thank you, thumbs up person, people. And if I ask you how many valence electrons does carbon have, you find carbon, chemical symbol C, look at the top. I have it written is the originally a periodic tables only have it in Roman numerals. But a while ago, I found out not all my students knew Roman numerals. So I put the numeric numbers up here and notice four carbon has four valence electrons. If I ask you how many valence electrons does sodium have? Your turn. Time's up. If you look over here, sodium Na, look at the top in red, it's one. And if I ask you how many valence electrons does chlorine have? And I've hidden it, but I'll go like this. Everybody see chlorine Cl? And if you look at the top, what number do you see at top of the column? It is seven. By the way, including hydrogen, for each column, the Roman numeral or the numeric tells you how many valence electrons. Now, we stayed away from the transition metals and the metals in the center. That's another game, which is for two semester chemistry. This is only one. And there are important, important things I want to teach you. Now, when we talk about valence electrons, you should know how to draw Lewis structures for elements. You use the chemical symbol. You only show valence, not all electrons. And you put one, this is only for elements. You put one valence electron on each side of the chemical symbol before doubling up. And therefore, if I asked you the following, nitrogen, and we looked earlier, and this had five valence electrons. And how do you do that? You draw the chemical symbol, put one on each side, then one more on one of the sides. Organic chemists always put it on top, but this is one way. There are four others you could draw. And that's how you do a Lewis structure for elements. Now, next, we got into really good stuff. I got to talk about chemical bonds. And there are two types of chemical bonds. One is ionic bond, the other is covalent bond. And the last day of lecture, I will be subtle. Meaning the definitions for ionic and covalent bond. An ionic bond results from the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. Again, it's from the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. Now, covalent bond results from the sharing of one or more pairs of electrons. And I hope you all know pair means two. Now, on the final, I will never ask this like I didn't ask, what's the octet rule? But it's important to understand that in a compound formation, when you're making molecules, atoms of elements lose, gain, or share electrons in such a way 
that their electronic configuration is identical to that of the noble gas nearest to them uh, in the periodic table. And that's eight valence electrons. Now, one of the things I taught you was what charge, what ion will a element form? And you learn that it has so many electrons like calcium. What's the nearest noble gas numerically based on atomic number? And that's the number of electrons it wants. Uh, but the protons stay the same. If we look at the periodic table, you'll see calcium here at 20. The nearest noble gas is argon at 18, which tells you it will have 18 electrons when it forms an ion because it wants that octet. But it'll still have 20 protons. So the charge will be 18, each electron minus one, each proton plus one. Do the math, add it together. You get plus two. And then you write the chemical symbol and superscript, write, you write the charge. Now, Dr. White likes the old style plus two, in your books, if you bought the book or on the internet, you'll see two plus. Either way would be correct on a test or my final. Now, charge balance and ionic compounds, it indicates when you have a formula of an ionic compound, it indicates the number and kind of ions that will make up a compound. And the most important thing you should remember is sum of all ionic charges in a molecule is always, always zero. If you find a case that's not true, let me know and we'll be rich beyond my wildest dreams. And that goes beyond having my own Lamborghini uh, Urus or the Ferrari SUV or my own fighter jets and my own island goes well beyond that. It doesn't exist. I taught you about polyatomic ions, and let's do the following. I can write it. And sometimes I would write, write the empirical formula. And why don't you do this? I'm going to share today the last day. I'm going to let you have some fun. So everybody have some fun. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. And those of you who are drinking coffee, I saw your thumb up. Dr. White's hearing might not be the best, but I still have good peripheral vision. Thank goodness. All right, let's get going. Question is, write the formula of a compound with calcium plus two and nitrate minus one. And this is a plus two, this is a minus one. And all molecules have a net zero charge. You can't change the charge, but you can change how many.
How do we get this to zero? To zero? We put a two in front. Guess what? When you try and say two and zero at the same time, it comes out zoo. <laughs> I crack myself up. And how do you write that? Well, this tells you you have one calcium, but now we have two of the polyatomic ion. With that, we show it in a bracket and subscript to the right of the closed parentheses or bracket, you have a two. Let me write that bigger. And that's how you do it. And next we talked about Lewis structure for molecular compounds. We talked about valence electrons that are shared between are called the covalent bond, which are called bonded electrons and uh, valence electrons that are not involved in a, I bet you can't see that, hold on. Ah, you can see it. Do you want this, uh, Kelly, or do you want the whiteboard? The whiteboard. But you didn't know I'm so famous, they name a board after me. <laughs> Do you believe that? I've got a bridge I can sell you in downtown Chicago cheap. Got it? I think so. All right. So we have bonded, non-bonding electrons in a covalent bond. And when we talk about covalent bonds, there are three types of covalent bonds. Oh no, everybody. It's class participation time. All together now. The first bond, single bond. The second bond, double bond. And the third bond, triple bond. triple bond. Thank you. And you should know a single bond is a bond between two atoms that share one pair of electrons. You should know a double bond is a bond in which two atoms share two pairs of electrons. And a triple bond is a bond in which two atoms share three pairs of electrons. And one of the things I asked you to do was know those. And if you look at test number two, I asked, uh, name two of the three bonds, I think, and also name how many electrons are involved. And you could have said single bond, one pair, double bond, two pair, and triple bond, three pair, and any two of those three. And that was on test number two which you hopefully still have a copy of. You didn't delete it from your computer because those are good study problems. Now, one of the things I asked you to do was draw the Lewis structure for nitrogen. And how do you do that? Well, you first have to know for each atom involved in what I'm asking you, how many valence electrons. And if we look at the periodic table, you'll find nitrogen has two valence electrons, but nitrogen gas has not one, but two nitrogen. So let's look how you would go about doing it. Each nitrogen has five valence electrons. And this nitrogen says to that one, I have three non-single electrons and you have three single electrons, let's share. And they do. And now remember the octet rule atoms gain, lose, or share electrons 
So they have a total of eight valence electrons. And if we look at this nitrogen right here, if you count the dots, everybody's seen dots between their eyes, the black dots, there's two, four, six, eight, eight valence electrons. And if we look at the other nitrogen, and we show all the shared non-bonding electrons, two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate, Dr. White? No, anyways, it's totally last day outrageous humor. But anyways, eight valence electrons, and that's how you do it. Now, let me remind you one more thing. Draw the Lewis structure for sodium hydroxide. Now, whenever you see an alkali metal or alkaline earth metal, it will always form a cation and sodium forms a plus one, even though it does have one valence electron. Oxygen has eight valence electron, not eight, six. Sorry about that, brain freeze. And hydrogen has one valence electron too. So I have my oxygen. It has two unpaired electrons. Hydrogen has one, so it says, let's share. And they do. I like the way I always say, and they do. But anyways, where do I get that from? Oh, Kung Fu Panda. That's where I picked saying it up, boy. Anyways, good series, all three of them. I have them in my collection. No matter how smart you are, the smarter your brain you are, the simpler the recreation your mind needs, cartoons. But anyways, but this only has hydrogen's octet is two. That's the one exception. But oxygen only has seven electrons. What's happening? Well, where did this electron from nitrogen and nitrogen from sodium go? It went to the oxygen. So now it has an extra electron. So you have between sodium and OH, which is hydroxide, an ionic bond, and sodium hydroxide between hydrogen and oxygen, you have a covalent bond. Remember, when you have an alkali metal, alkaline earth metal, I know of no example, it just doesn't exist, where they are in a covalent bond, none. And I've asked for years other chemists, am I missing something? And nobody is, everybody agrees with me. Next, we got into the really good stuff of chemistry mole and mole calculations. And if you can see me right now, well, you can not see me. I'm smiling because Dr. White loves moles. I like organic chemistry better, but in this type of chemistry, moles are cool. And you should know what a mole is. A mole is a chemist counting unit. And important information is one mole of an element equals Avogadro's number. And this should be, hold on, let me change that. One of these decades, I'll fix it. There we go. One mole of a compound equals Avogadro's number. Remember, Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. One mole of a compound is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of that compound. Remember, this will be given to you important information, final exam. One of the things I did about two years ago and I did this semester, I've cut down on your memorization where I'm trying to see, do you know the chemistry, not how good your memory is under stress. And one mole of an element equals the atomic weight of that element in grams one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that. Uh, one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. And the molecular weight is the sum of all atomic weights in that compound. 
Remember on the final, just like on test two, three, and four, please use three significant figures for all atomic weights. And if you look on there, I tell you, remember to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. Got that in one more time and use it really. Hopefully that's been your good buddy, your good friend all semester. And tomorrow and Thursday, I'll go through a couple of these. I won't do it today. Now, next thing I taught you was the chemical equation. And that shows a chemical reaction in a graphical form. And remember, you have an arrow. At the base of the arrow, in this case A and B, those are the reactants, also known as starting materials. If you work in industry. And at the head of the arrow always is the product or products. Now, we did balancing chemical equations. I'll do one or two tomorrow or Friday. Uh, when you're balancing a chemical equation, remember, you must have the same number and same type of element on each side of the chemical equation, meaning the arrow. You can't change the formulas. You can only change the coefficients. And remember, my advice to you is leave hydrogen and oxygen last, and also remember the even odd trick, which I will go through tomorrow or Friday. Next, I talked about mass calculations. And that's one, if you have a chemical reaction, uh, how many grams of this do you need to react to make so many grams of a product or other ways of doing that? It's three steps. Whatever you're given in weight, you should convert to moles. Then convert the moles of one compound to the moles of another. And finally, once you get the moles of B, convert it to grams of B, which you've learned for test two, and you also use in test three. And as I say, remember the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation are the molar ratios. And let me just remind you of that. Now, if we look at this, notice I have four hydrogen, four hydrogen, two oxygen, two oxygen. And what this tells you, everybody see the water equation on there? Thank you. This tells you two moles of hydrogen. Remember the coefficient two, number in front of the chemical of the formula, molecular formula, two moles of hydrogen. When there's no number, it's number one react with one mole of oxygen to make two moles of water. Again, two moles of hydrogen react with one mole of oxygen to make two moles of water. And that you can use with your good buddy, your good friend, to convert moles of hydrogen to moles of water, or vice versa, moles of oxygen to moles of water, or vice versa. I even said that all semester. I just thought about it. I've never said vice versa yet. I just did. Write that down in your diary. Have you noticed, does everybody see limiting reactants on your screen? It's time for end of the semester, Dr. White gift to you. And my gift to you, everybody paying attention, don't tell anybody, but on the final, I will not have a question on limiting reactants. That's my gift to you. I hope you enjoy it. It's almost like Christmas or Hanukkah. You got a gift. And for those who don't celebrate those religion, let me <laughs> send by chat what things you celebrate where you get a gift for your religion, I'll mention that too, because Dr. White is an equal opportunity to try to keep everybody equal. Can I tell you I play favorites in my class? All my students are my favorites.
And that's test number two review. Any questions on test number two review material? Going once, going twice. So let's move on to test number three. All right, in test number three, we talked about gases. I remember gases are something that has a state of matter that has indefinite shape and definite volume. And one of the things you measure in gas is pressure, just like the pressure in your car tires, or if you have a volleyball, uh, basketball, football, you know, does it have enough pressure in there? And the atmospheric pressure around you. Remember, you're surrounded by a gas. Chemistry is everywhere. Well, I haven't done this in a while. And chemistry is everywhere. I stole that from SpongeBob. And when we measure gases, there are two uh, number of scales. One is millimeters of mercury. The other is named after the great Italian scientists, I don't think they even called them chemists back then, Torricelli, Tor. And one millimeter mercury equals one Tor. Now, by definition, 760 Tor equals 760 millimeters of mercury equal one atmosphere, which is another. And 760 and one are exact numbers. Next, a lot of the formulas, we use Calvin. And therefore, I'm reminding you, which we did for test one, but you also have to use in test three, Calvin equals degree C plus 273, and 273 is a exact number. Now, I taught you about the gas laws. And the gas laws are a series of mathematical relationships in de dealing with gas that are always true. That's why they're called law. A law is something that's always true. And I was just going to do a bad joke about the Republicans, but I won't. All right, I'll let you figure out what the bad joke was. But anyways, the first law I talked about was Boyle's Law, which is, will be an important information. But Boyle's Law is P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. And P1 is the initial pressure. V1 is the initial volume. They can be in any units. And P2 is the final pressure, and V2 is the final volume. Now, in Boyle's Law problems, you'll always be given P1 and V1. And then you'll be given either P2 or V2, and you'll have to solve for the one you do or not given. Let's assume uh, you're given and I'm going to let you try just doing a little math. So you, in case you're rusty, you'll be up to speed for Monday. Have fun. All I'm asking you to do is solve for V2. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. Oh, I see a lot of thumbs, Bob. I better get to work. 
Are you people hitchhiking on Dr. White's course? <laughs> oh, is that awful? I'll never use that again, maybe. All right. We have P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. And we figured out, and I've taught you how to read a problem and how to identify what are you solving for and what are you given. And we want to solve for V2. We want it alone on one side. How do we get rid of P2? Anything divided by itself equals the number one. Therefore, if I want to get rid of P2, I'll divide by P2. Anything I do on one side, I have to do on the other. And this cancels out, that becomes the number one. And therefore we have V2 equals P1 times V1 over P2. But Dr. White always likes to rewrite it because it's easier when you're putting in the stuff. And that's how you solve it. And in the uh, example on test uh, number two, I had either something to do with a cylinder or balloon, I can't remember which, and that's how you do it. Next, everybody see the ideal gas law on your screen? Thank you. Next, I taught you the ideal gas law. And this is my favorite, all time favorite, mathematical equation in chemistry. Now, other chemical equations in organic are my real favorite, but when it comes to math, the ideal gas law takes the cake, or in this case, takes the gas. <laughs> Anyways, PV equal NRT. What is P? Pressure. And that's always in atmospheres. What's V? It's a volume in liters, and I'll always give you liters. N is the number of moles, which you won't get, you'll get grams. T is the temperature in Kelvin, but you'll get degrees C, so you'll have to know how to convert to this, just like you have to go from grams to moles. And finally, R is the universal gas law constant with these units. This is three significant figures. There are other versions of R more significant but I've never had to use anything more. Oh no, if I look at the clock, time flies when you're having fun with review for the final, and it's time for our break. I'll see you in five minutes, come back at 10.55, I'll see you in five.
All aboard. Train's leaving the station. Let's get back to work. All right, just talking about the ideal gas law. Hopefully you all see that on your screen. Thumbs up, people. Can you see it? Thank you. Or nod your head, people, too. And I was talking about the ideal gas law. And here, generally, you'll be given one, two, three, four. And one of these, either this or generally this or this, I've never done one. I've never done one with the temperature. You should know how to solve for. If I give you V grams and R and T, you should know how to solve for P. Same thing, volume. Now, if I ask you to solve for moles, remember this you'll need. two steps. First, solve for N. And second, N, which is moles, you go to grams and that you need to know. Now, the other thing, remember, Dr. White's public service to my students, you all, you all, sounds like I'm Southern. Hi, you all, but anyways, I've done for you, remember, and I asked this on the test number two, explain with an equation how you know to test, check your car tires in the winter or in the summer. And that's still true. You should do that. And what I taught you was oh, summer, the temperature goes way up, PV equal NRT. In your tires, this is constant, this is constant, and the volume is constant. So if temperature goes up, then the pressure will go up because these are constant in your tires unless you get a flat and then all bets are off. And in the winter, temperature goes way down. This winter wasn't too bad. But if you remember a couple of winters ago when we had the minus 25 temperature, not wind chill, or minus 20. Well, again, PV equal NRT for your car tires, volume, moles, and R, which is a constant. These all stay constant. So if the temperature goes way down, the pressure will go down. And I told you a story that one cold morning a number of years ago when I lived in an apartment complex, I knew it was cold and I wanted to start my tire, my car for the battery. I walked out there and saw all the tires were low. I said, oh no, how can I have four flats? And it took about, oh, about a half a second. Part of my brain yelled out, no, it's PV equal NRT get yourself that gas station, which I did. And by the time I finished my four tires, I was lucky I was the first one there. There was already a line of about 10 cars, which is another one of my favorite memories. Well, I have a lot of favorite memories this semester too from you, thank you. Next, I talked about Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. That's the to uh, total pressure of a mixture of gases is the sum of the partial pressures of each gas, P1, P2, 
P3. Partial pressure, which I'll never ask on a test, but still you should be familiar with, is the pressure of a gas in a mixture if it were alone. The partial pressure is the pressure of a gas in a mixture as if it were alone. Next, we talked about boiling. And boiling point of a liquid is one, the vapor pressure, which is just a way of saying the pressure of the gas of that liquid when it's in a gas form equals atmospheric pressure. And that's what's called the boiling point or boiling temperature. And therefore, you should know, and I asked on test number three, this is test number three material, the higher the altitude on the Earth, the lower the atmospheric pressure, and the lower the boiling point the liquid is. And I think I used in test number three, what happens in a boiling point of water when you go up to the top of the Himalayans, which I think is the highest mountain range on our planet, and the highest mountain peak. And the answer is, and I also asked that dreaded, dreaded thing on a test, please explain. And students, you were asked to explain. And the question, the answer is, the temperature decreases because the atmospheric pressure is lower. Next, we got into solutions. And solutions are mixtures of chemical compounds that do not lose their own chemical identity. In other words, when you mix two things together, they don't change their chemical identity. They don't react. Now, for those of you who had a chance to try, I know some of your kids did too. Remember when we put sodium in water, it did react. And that doesn't form a solution. That forms a chemical reaction. And remember, those of you who tried it, when the graduated solar went boom, blew up. And hopefully you enjoyed that. All right. Now, you should know, solution contains a solvent and a solute. The solvent, by definition, is the component of the solution present in the greatest amount. The solute or solutes are all the other components. All right, that's the solution. Now, there's a special thing that people at first glance say, oh, that's a solution. It's not. And that's called the colloidal dispersion. Those are particles suspended, not dissolved in each other in a liquid. And it's not a solution. How can you tell? Well, the suspended particles, which aren't present in a solution, but are present in a colloidal dispersion, scatter light. Time for Dr. White's red light. As I told you, I have a collection of flashlights. I'm a flashlight fanatic. I think I have about 25, 30 different types of flashlights. Yep, I've been collecting them since I was a little kid. My first one was this big beacon one like the fireman used that my father got for me. Oh, I love that. It died eventually. But anyways, that's a colloidal dispersion. And examples of that would be latex paint, mayonnaise, your blood, those are all examples of colloidal dispersions. Now, one of the most useful things I taught you this semester is the concept of light dissolves light. And that means light solutes are soluble in light solvents. And what that means is there are two types of materials you can break down, polar and nonpolar. And what light dissolves light really means is polar solutes are soluble in polar solvents, and nonpolar solutes are soluble in nonpolar solvents. And if you mix the two together, they're not. And what's polar? Water, alcohol, and salts are. What's nonpolar? Well, in our day, your daily life and mine too, vegetable oil, gasoline, Vaseline, baby oil, grease and dirt are no are nonpolar. Oh, I even threw a not know this, and you should. Now, here are a couple of definitions that I won't ask you, but you should know how to use this, because I did ask questions like that. 
and that is solubility of a solute. That's the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve in a given solvent. Again, solubility of a solute is the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve in a given solvent. Then there are different types of solutions. Saturated solution is a solution that contains the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve under conditions in which the solution exists, such as temperature and pressure, and also solvent. Dilute solution is a solution that can, contains a small amount that could uh, uh, solute relative to the amount that could dissolve. So saturated, you've got a lot. It's, or you've, at, you're at the limit. Dilute, you got a small amount. Now, less than saturated, but still a lot, we have concentrated solution. And a solution that contains it's a solution that contains a large amount of solute relative to the amount that could dissolve. And as I mentioned, that's where the name concentrated orange juice came from, because it's technically a concentrated solution that's frozen. All right, the last thing I taught you in definitions, and probably one of the most important of these, is an aqueous solution. Aqueous comes from the Latin or Spanish word aqua, water, and an aqueous solution is a solution in which water is the solvent and it's abbreviated by bracket AQ close bracket. And on test number three, I asked you, uh, what does this mean? I'll explain that in a second. And I asked you, what's the solvent of this? And you saw bracket AQ close bracket and the solvent was water, which is an aqueous solution. Next, we talked about concentration. And concentration of solutions tells you how much solute is present in a given amount of solvent. Now, there are three types. The first two I didn't ask you to learn. I went over it, but on the final, I won't have that on there. And that is uh, the three type, first one is percent by mass, next one is concentration, next one is percent by volume, and the last one, molarity, which is one of the most important concepts in solutions and chemistry. And molarity, which is uh, shown by a capital M of a solution, is a ratio giving the number of moles per liter of solution. But in the lab, we use 1,000 milliliters, which is equal to one liter. Therefore, the molarity of a comp of a solution is moles per liter of solute or moles per 1,000 milliliters. And I'll ask you the following, let you have a little fun. What does the following mean? 7.89 capital M NACL. Don't forget, please pass the NACL. Hopefully everybody's done. So let me get working. And as soon as you see a capital M, that means molarity. So what does this mean? 
7.89 moles of sodium chloride per 1,000 milliliters. And I asked questions. That's weird. The milliliters didn't want to stick up here. Let's try this again. That's better. And I ask questions. If you had 100 milliliters of a, or 151 milliliters of a 7.89 molar sodium chloride solution, how many moles of sodium chloride? And I'll go through that on Thursday or Friday because I want to finish everything today. And another thing, question I asked, and I would highly recommend you go back and look at your hourly exams or the practice problems for those hourly exams. And you'll see I asked the question, how many grams of certain solute do you need to make so many milliliters of a so many molar solution? And there you need two steps. And the first step is convert mole milliliters to moles. And the second step, moles to grams. And this I will cover Thursday or Friday. And just a reminder, one mole of an element equals atomic weight of that element in grams. One mole of compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. And the molecular weight of a compound is the sum of all atomic weights. Hang in there while I open up something. All right, everybody see nuclear radiation on your screen? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. All right, now on the final, I'll have, what is it, four or six points on nuclear radiation. And the key things you should know first of all, the half life of a radioisotope is the amount of time it requires for one half of any given quantity of a radioactive substance to decay. And I went through problems of that, know that. And I'll do that either Thursday or Friday. You don't have to come and I'll post it on the video, but I'd highly recommend you come. So if you have any questions, I'll answer them. The next thing you should know, there's two types of radiation. The first one is nuclear fission. And nuclear fission is a process in which a large nucleus something that's big, splits into, <clears throat> excuse me, two smaller or medium-sized nuclei, which also has a lot of energy given off and also loss of neutrons. And you should know an example of fission, nuclear fission with an eye, is a nuclear reactor that uses in Illinois to make our electricity. Now, the other type of nuclear reaction is nuclear fusion with a U. And this is a process in which small nuclei are slammed together to make larger ones and give off a lot of energy. And on our sun, if you happen to look at the sun, but please wear proper eye protection, you will see a chemical reaction, a nuclear chemical reaction, a hydrogen reacting to make helium 
and a lot of energy, which keeps us alive. And you should know what's an example of nu nu yeah, nuclear fusion. The U in fusion gives it away the sun, which also has a U in it. And I'll go through right now. Everybody see collision theory on your duck? <laughs> that way you won't get hit by a molecule colliding or atoms. Oh, that was hideous humor. Eh. All right. Remember the collision theory and the most important thing, molecules have to collide. We talked about the reaction rate, how fast, and you should know what are the things that make a reaction rate go faster? And one of the most important things you should know, which I just asked on test number four, is the rule of thumb that the reaction rate doubles for every 10 degrees C increase in a reaction rate. And on test number four, which I went through on Monday, but I'll remind you again, you should know how does a catalyst work? It lowers the activation energy. What does a catalyst do? It makes the reaction go quicker. And I showed you exothermic reaction gives off heat, endothermic reaction, you add heat. And I also showed you how to do them energy diagrams, which I'm not going to go through now because we went through that on Monday. And if you, oh, by the way, time for a commercial from Dr. White, a couple of them actually. Number one, if you have any questions, don't forget tonight, I will be having my office hours on Zoom as I've done all semester. Number two, if you like what I did, go to ratemyprofessor.com and put something down or if you didn't like what I did, go to ratemyprofessor.com, put something down. Also, if you really, really, really like what I did, send an email to the Board of Trustees. You can go to Google, put in COD, Board of Trustees, and you'll get to their homepage where they have contact information, uh, the email address for them. Also, if you didn't really, really like what I did, you can do that too. And finally, I would ask as all instructors, have been getting emails to tell their students to do. If you have a chance, do the COD evaluation of Dr. White. And those are totally anonymous. I will not see them. I don't even see the results until well after the grades have been posted. So they will not affect your grade if you do that. Next, I talked about chemical equilibrium. Oh, I have to. Everybody see Dr. White being subtle again? Thank you. All right. Chemical equilibrium, I have up here A plus B is in equilibrium with C plus D. Equilibrium shows you reverse reaction, forward and reverse. That's why you have the double arrow. And in an equilibrium reaction, the forward and reverse rate of reaction are the same. Oh, I asked that on test number four. And I also asked you how to draw the equilibrium constant, or not draw, write it, which is written here. And it's the concentration of products divided by reactants. to the power of the coefficient. Remember, it's times, not plus. And when K equilibrium is much greater than one, more products are made. When it's less than one, more reactants concentration are higher. Then I talked to you about Le Chatelier's principle. Once again, 
Dr. White gets to use his north side of Chicago French accent. I just butchered his name again. Don't tell anybody the French consulate. But anyways, you should understand that an equilibrium shifts in the position to reduce the stress on the equilibrium. And therefore, by adding or removing uh, reactants or products, will shift the equilibrium and temperature will re shift the re equilibrium for both the exothermic and endothermic reaction. And re you should remember ice bath removes heat, boiling water adds heat. Do I have time? Oh, I do. And it's time for me to share the fun again. And can everybody see that for the equation, equilibrium equation right here? What happens to concentration of A and G if I add some B? And part B is if I put the reaction in an ice bath. Your turn. And when you're done, oh, I'm going to do the poll. You can also do thumbs up if you like. Oh, the votes are coming in. And the winner is yes. So let's go ahead. All right. At equilibrium. There's a certain amount of A, B, G, H, and heat. When I add more B, oh no, we have too much B. How do we get rid of it? A and B react to make G, H, and E. Therefore, if A reacts with B, A is consumed. When you consume something, like my French sulfide, luckily I didn't go out and buy, you have less. It decreases. And if A and B react to make, get rid of the excess B, they'll make more G, H, and X. You make more of something, in this case G, you'll have more of it. The concentration will increase. 
or increases, and let's go to B. And when you put it in an ice bath, this removes heat. And at equilibrium, let me clean up this. At equilibrium, there was a certain amount of heat. You've removed some of it and says, oh no, I don't have enough heat. I need more heat. How do you make more heat? A and B, I didn't have to erase this, but make more heat. And if you react A and B, A is consumed and it will also decrease. Or decreases either way. If you don't put the S there, I'm never going to take off points. And if you A and B react to make more heat, they're also going to make more G and H. And therefore, the amount of G will increase. Or increases if you want to put the S there. And that's how you do it. Next, I talked about Bronsted Laurean bases, and you should know a Bronsted Laurean base is a proton donor. I'm bad. <laughs> let me repeat, let me wind that back. Nor, 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 nor. A Bronsted Laurean acid is a proton donor, a Bronsted Laurean base is a proton acceptor. And you should know that HCl. Hydrochloric acid, H2SO4, sulfuric acid, HNO3, nitric acid are surprise acids. And you should know NaOH, KOH, and ammonia. And one I don't have down here, you should also know. Sodium bicarbonate. Baking powder is also a base. And I ask questions like that in test four. Water is an amazing chemical compound, and it can react to itself in an equilibrium that's mostly on the left, but enough is formed of the hydronium hydroxide ion that we can say the equilibrium constant. No, you don't write that. You write the ionization constant, Kw, named after me, Dr. White, not Dr. Kenneth White, my initials, not really, are hydronium times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And for acid spaces and neutral solutions, when the hydronium ion concentration is greater than hydroxide, it's acidic. When is hydroxide greater than hydronium, it's basic, sometimes called alkaline. Look at your alkaline batteries. And finally, when they're equal, hydroxide equal hydronium neutral solution. Now, this is hard to remember. So they came up with the pH constant. And I'll never ask you what the pH scale is, but it's a number used to describe the hydronium ion concentration, which can be used to describe is acidic neutral basic. And this will be given to you pH equal minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. I will also do this gift to you. If H3O plus is 1.0 times 10 to the minus X and you put it in here, then pH is X. This I won't give to you. This is one of the more important things I'll ask you to learn. And that's the pH scale. pH scale is from 0 to 14. Halfway between that's neutral solution, hydroxide equals hydronium. Below 7 is acidic. Above 7 is basic. 
And next, I talked about buffers. These are solutions that when you add a small amount of acid or base, they don't change the pH. And I talked to you about titrations. Don't forget to hand in your titration lab. How many of you, oh, I got this. I'm gonna do a poll, but I'm not gonna change the question, but I'll tell you what, I'm gonna do it differently. All right, answer yes, if you like doing the Beyond Lab Z Labs this semester, answer no, if you didn't like them. It looks like the majority of you like them. I could have also asked to get answer yes if your kids like them, answer no if you didn't. And there's more than one parent in our class whose kids like them. All right. Well, thank you for your feedback. And then I showed you titrations and at neutral uh, at neutralization when the pH indicator changes color, like phenolphthalein moles of acid equals moles of base. You'll be given milliliters and milliliters in either molarity of acid or molarity of base. You'll solve for the other to get the molarity of the base or acid of unknown. Anybody have any questions? I've gone to gallery view. Everybody turn on your webcam. Oh, thank you everybody. Cause this way I can wave goodbye. And remember on Thursday and Friday, use your normal class login. You're invited to come by and I'm gonna do some problems with what I talked about today. And with that, I'm gonna do something I haven't done all semester. I'm going to let you out a couple minutes early. And for the last time this semester for our lecture, Dr. White will say, <laughs> which I clicked, let me do that again. And for the last time this semester, Dr. White will say, gang is on, be healthy. Remember next week, no classes. Final is on Monday, starting at 10 a.m. And with that, gang gazun, goodbye. And thank you very much, all of you, for being my class semester. Because you found out chemistry is fun. It is. Gang gazun, goodbye.